Hello, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to talk about my research here. Uh, can you see my slides? I can, yes. Okay, great. Yeah, today I'm going to talk about some methods for closed loop phase dependent EEG TMS. And let's go over some quick background in case you're not familiar. Uh, TMS or transcranial magnetic stimulation is a non-invasive neuromodulation technique where you use a magnetic coil to stimulate the brain and modulate brain activity. TMS is used a lot in research and clinical applications. Also, EEG or electroencephalography is a non-invasive uh, brain recording technique where you use um, where you use some electrodes you put on the scalp to non-invasively record brain activity. The nice thing about EEG is the direct readout from the electrical activity of the brain, so it's basically instantaneous readout. And uh, I'm gonna briefly talk about why we care about phase specifically in EEG. Uh, so if you're familiar with EEG, you would know that EEG is made up of a few different oscillations, like in different uh, bands of interest, like some frequency bands, for example, alpha, beta, theta. And based on a lot of previous uh, studies, we know that each of these frequency bands, is, these oscillations, they play an important point, a distinct important functions in the brain. And uh, you can characterize those EEG oscillations from different uh, like perspectives or different uh, characteristics. Uh, here, we mainly care about EEG phase. Uh, because some, like several studies, have reported that phase of the EEG, uh, like, is a biomarker of brain excitability. For example, if you deliver your TMS at the peak or at the trough, you get more or less excitability. Uh, in other words, the brain responsiveness changes depending on the phase of the oscillation, uh, depending on when you stimulate the brain and except for a few uh, recent publications uh, all of those publications that have studied phase were based on like offline post hoc analysis but since we know that phase of the EEG is a uh, can be used as a tool to inform us about the state of the brain why not use it uh, to inform us about the timing of the stimulation. For example, we can deliver the TMS at the excitable state of the brain to get a higher outcome. And basically, this is the general concept for real-time closed-loop TMS EEG to deliver TMS based on the phase of the oscillation. The way it works is that you put, uh, like you record your uh, brain activity from the EEG you get some EEG signals. You can filter the EEG in the band of interest, for example, alpha. And then you can take uh, like process that signal in real time to detect the phase and deliver the TMS at any phase that you are interested in, for example, the peak. And then trigger the TMS to deliver the TMS at the peak. That's the general concept. And uh, just a quick note that throughout this, uh, this uh, uh, presentation, when we talk about processing signals in real time, we talk about processing a window of data. For example, one second or half a second of data, uh, like up onto the present moment. And the reason we just take a short window of time is because we only care about the phase at the current time and because the longer window you take the more processing time it takes we don't deal with anything that happens before that and we mainly talk about processing on the window of time and now that you know the general concept about uh, like real-time closed loop tms eeg although it sounds simple but there are uh, several challenges that you have to 
be careful of when you do this in real time. Uh, I'm gonna go over the detail of each of them, but like these are some of the main challenges, the speed accuracy trade-off, system delays, and causality limitations. The speed accuracy trade-off, as the name suggests, there is a trade-off between speed and accuracy. And the reason it is important is that usually for any kind of applications that you use, uh, the performance, like higher performance means higher computation time as well. And that means your speed of the computation gets lower. And that uh, might not be an issue if you're processing something in like in an offline processing. If it takes two seconds or three seconds, it doesn't matter. It's one second of difference. You can deal with that. But in real time, it's extremely important that you are able to do everything in real time. And uh, for example, let's say my sampling rate of EEG is one kilohertz. That means a new sample is coming in uh, every one millisecond. So if my processing takes more than one millisecond, then my system would lag behind and wouldn't be able to perform things in real time. So it is very important. We have a limitation in terms of minimum speed of our algorithm. And that puts a cap in terms of the performance that we can, like the accuracy that we can detect the phase. So that is the speed accuracy trade-off. And then let's talk about system delays. So uh, in our real-time setup, we have to deal with a bunch of different delays, hardware delays and software delays. And these are some of those delays, for example, the the time between EEG, uh, like uh, like collecting EEG until streaming it to the computer data, to the computer takes uh, some time. Then you have to you have a system like software delay. It takes time to analyze the data that you have streamed to the computer. Then when you detect your TMS pulse, you have to issue a trigger uh, to the to the TMS machine, and that also takes time. And even if you, uh, when you deliver the TMS pulse, uh, when you deliver the trigger to the TMS machine, there's gonna be a delay until the TMS pulse is actually delivered. And here are some uh, like example uh, like delays based on the setup that we have. It's obviously system dependent, but as you see, we have to deal with around maybe 10 milliseconds of delay in the system. And the reason that is important is imagine uh, even if we detect the target accurately, let's say I want to target the peak and I can detect that accurately with my algorithm. By the time uh, you trigger the TMS pulse, uh, the signal is already passed, like you would deliver the TMS like 10 milliseconds or something after that, which would hit a different phase, not the one that you wanted. Although your algorithm is working correctly, there is a time shift and you have to deal with that in your uh, online setup. And the other thing, limitation, it's important is uh, causality limitation. If you're familiar with uh, signal processing, you would know that when we talk about causality, practically speaking, it means that we only uh, have to deal, like we have access to the data from the previous moment up until the, to the current moment. We don't have data from the future. And obviously when you wanna do your processing in real time, you don't have any data from the future. You only have the data up until the current time point. And because of that causality limitation, you're uh, gonna end up with some uh, like distortions in your signal. And this is like an important one that I'm gonna go over. Let's imagine your this yellow signal is your raw EEG signal and you have a window of time, let's say one second or something, 
and you want to band pass filter this window of time to get your oscillation in the band of interest for example alpha band uh, this is your like filter kernel your band pass filter if you're familiar with signal processing you would know that i uh, would have to convolve my filter kernel with the signal that i have and i will end up something like the orange signal that's the filtered version of the draw signal in this window that i have but let's also imagine that in during offline analysis when i have access to the whole data from previous and past to the time that i'm interested in i can filter the data with a causal filtering like uh, get access from everything and i would uh, end up with this blue signal which i call the ground truth there is no distortion there is no causality limitations in it when i compare the uh, the filter the version of the window with the whole signal as you would see the middle of the signal is pretty similar to the ground truth but the edges of the signal is distorted because when you apply the filter kernel there is no data after or before this time point of interest and as you see that causes some sh uh, like distortions to the phase and that basically messes up the whole process that we want to uh, do because we care about the phase at the current time point so this is another thing that you have to deal with in your real-time uh, algorithm and basically a general idea that most of the real-time phase detection algorithms do uh, is the following so basically the first part of the setup is the same you filter you stream the data you bandpass filter your data and because we know that the edge of the signal is distorted it's not usable i get rid of that and I only use the viable uh, like signal that I have, then I will apply a forward prediction method that I'm gonna talk about later to predict the signal in the future based on what I ha currently have that is on distorted data, and then detect the phase based on the predicted signal that is not distorted anymore from the edge. And uh, basically, this forward prediction will help us with the causality limitation, the edge distortion of uh, bandpass filtering, and also system delay. Uh, for example, if my system has 10 millisecond of delay, I can predict that in my forward prediction and trigger the signal 10 millisecond earlier so that the TMS pulse is actually delivered uh, at the time that I care about. And with forward prediction, you can uh, take care of these two challenges, but this challenge is still remaining and you have to be careful. The algorithm that you design has to be fast enough to be able to run in real time. And as a result, you will lose some accuracy. And this forward prediction is the basis for most algorithms uh, out there. And let's talk about some of the details of the previous methods before I talk about the method that we proposed. So at the time that I started working on this project for the TMS EEG, there have been like a few methods proposed for real-time phase detection. And I categorize those methods into two general categories um to basically forward prediction in time domain and forward prediction in frequency domain but generally speaking all of them do some sort of forward prediction and today i'm going to discuss uh, in more detail uh, one method of each of these categories and then i'm going to talk about our own method so the first method is auto regressive or ar model it's a forward prediction in time domain and uh, it, it, they, it, in case you're not familiar with autoregressive models, it's a regression based on the signal itself. Like auto means self, regressive is like a regression uh, equation. 
And this is the equation that we have. It's a regular regression uh, formula, but uh, the general idea is that you can use the previous samples of your signal and fit your regression and then uh, use it to predict the next sample. So for example, uh, I can use like P number of samples, let's say 10 samples that I have to predict the uh, sample that is coming next. And if I iteratively do that, I can predict my signal in, uh, in the future as much as I want to. And mm, the the only tricky part about autoregressive model is to uh, like find these coefficients that these weights that are applied in this regression model and there are some mathematical like uh, ways to do that i'm not gonna uh, go over the details of that but there are some uh, methods available for calculating these weights but um, the way you would use this autoregressive model in real time is uh, like this. Imagine the black signal is your raw signal and you capture a window of uh, that like half a second and this dotted signal is the current time point at the present. If you bandpass filter the data and get rid of the edges that are distorted shown in like gray, you will end up with the blue signal. This is the bandpass filtered data without the edges, so it's not distorted anymore. Then you can fit your autoregressive model on the blue signal and then iteratively predict the uh, upcoming samples after that based on this AR model. And this is your forward predicted data. This is in time domain. And uh, you can apply a Hilbert transform on your predicted data, which gives you the instantaneous phase at any sample. And based on that, you can detect any phase that you care about and then deliver your TMS. And this is a video that I'm gonna play, but before playing that, uh, let me explain. The blue signal is my ground truth. It's uh, from offline processing. So there is no edge distortion or delay involved in it. The orange signal is the bandpass filtered data of the raw signal in this window, and I have removed the edges. So I have captured 500 milliseconds of data. I removed the edges at the beginning and at the end. And the orange signal is what is left of the bandpass filtered data. The yellow signal is the autoregressive model. And I didn't show you the Hilbert transform, but uh, to simplify the figure, but let's say I want to track the peak, uh, the upcoming peak. And uh, I can detect the peak from the predicted signal. So if you see the video, you would see that the bandpass filtered data changes, um, but the predicted peak is, although it wiggles around, but it's fairly close to the actual peak. The second method that I'm going to talk about is fast Fourier transform or FFT. It's a uh, forward prediction in frequency domain. And this is how it works. Uh, again, like the black signal is my raw signal. I bandpass filter the data and I will end up with the purple signal. Then I will uh, like transform that into a Fourier uh, domain, which is like using FFT in case you're familiar. I can look at the frequency content of that filtered data. and I will get something like this. And the idea in this method is to take the dominant frequency, basically the uh, strongest uh, like sine wave in that whole oscillation and its corresponding phase. And I will get with a single uh, sine wave that I can just put uh, on top of my signal. And because it's just a single sine wave, I can uh, predict in predict that infinitely because it's just a simple equation. In other words, in this method, I simplify my whole oscillation in the purple signal 
with a single sine wave fit that kind of simplifies uh, that uh, signal that is made up of different uh, oscillations into a single frequency oscillation. And that, that is easily predicted in the future, forward predicted in the future, and I can detect the phase easily. And this is a video of the fast Fourier transform method. Again, uh, the blue signal is my ground truth. Uh, the orange signal is the filtered data. The, this is the frequency content of my filtered data shown at the bottom. The star shows the dominant the frequency. And based on that, I fit my sine, sine wave in the yellow and predict the future. As you can see, it kind of works, but uh, it's less stable compared to the previous method that we discussed. And the reason is that FFT of like a short window of time is not very stable. So it changes a lot. So it's not easy to detect the frequency content of a short amount of data accurately. And then uh, we propose our own method, which is a different category compared to the previous one, which were in forward prediction in time domain and frequency domain. The, the commonality between those previous categories is that they only use the data that they have available during the real time application. So if you get like half a second window of signal, that's all you have to work with. You don't have any other a priori a priori information. But we said, uh, why not uh, use it, take a different approach. Let's uh, record a short amount of like EEG data before doing the real time uh, method and extract some features that we care about that would help us uh, in our real time uh, phase detection. And that is why we call this training-based method, because you train the algorithm first, and then you use it in real time. And still, we have to do a forward prediction, but uh, you use some a priori information in order to help you that with that. And this is the general idea, like an analogy for that. Let's imagine uh, you're walking on the street, and there are some apple trees by the side, uh, on the side of the street, and you see there are some apples falling on the ground. Uh, you see the first apple, and the second apple is like with the distance of L relative to the first apple. Then you walk more forward, and you see the third apple is 1.1 L distance compared to the second apple, and so on. And once you reach the fifth apple, you see there is a general pattern uh, here. And if you would have to guess where uh, the next apple would be, uh, like intuitively, you would say it's around L distance because everything else was around L. Although there are some uh, like uh, jitters around L, but generally speaking, they follow the same pattern. And this is the same idea that we use, just swap uh, apples with peak intervals in my uh, EEG oscillation. And basically, I will learn this pattern in my signal and then use that in my real time application. So, this is how it works. First of all, I will, before doing the real time portion, I will do the training. And for that, I record three minutes of EEG in resting state. Then I bandpass filter the whole data. Uh, and I will get my oscillation in the band of interest, for example, in the alpha band. Then I can uh, look at the interval between each subsequent peaks. Imagine these are my apples, and I find the distance between each of my apples. And uh, in my three minutes of recording, I have a lot of these uh, intervals between the peaks and if I draw the histogram of that, I will get something like this. Uh, sometimes the peaks are closer together, sometimes the peaks are farther away from each other, but more often than not, most of the peaks are 
uh, close to a central value, like basically the median, that uh, I will call it T, like the typical interval for that cycle in that oscillation. And after the learning period, when, uh, because I know the value of T, I can use that to project peaks in real time. And this is how I do it. Like the black signal is again my signal in that half a second window of time that I have. I get rid of the edge uh, because as you know, it can distort the signal. Then I detect the last peak that I have. And because I know typically uh, the distance between each uh, pair of peaks, like adjacent peaks is T, I can project the peak that I have into the future and that would give us the next peak. And as you can see in this approach, although I'm forward predicting, but I'm not predicting the whole signal because I don't care about the whole signal. I can only predict, for example, if I care about the peak, I can only uh, project the peak. And it's just one single time point. It's the time point that I care about. And because of that, the computation is much simpler and the algorithm is faster. And the method sounds very simple and it is kind of simple, but there is a caveat to it. After we implemented this, we found that uh, sometimes there is some systematic time shifts. Like for example, we saw that on average, we are, let's say, five millisecond too early or five millisecond too late. And this depends on each participant. So it's an individual systematic error that we had that we wanted to resolve and get rid of those systematic shift in time. And we, add, we adjusted the training a little bit. So we added a second part of the training to the first part. And basically, I still use that three minutes of recording that I have, but I use the first half of that three minutes, which is 90 seconds, to do the peak interval detection that I talked about. But then I will use the second half of that uh, recording to uh, kind of adjust the value of T to basically simulate uh, something that would happen in real time. But of course, because it's uh, pre-recorded data, I have access to gr my ground truth. So in uh, this simulation part, uh, I basically uh, try to mimic what would happen in real time. So I uh, like cut my 90 second of data into half a second uh, like trials. I uh, I detect the peak and I project the peak with the value of T. And because I already have the whole data, I can calculate the ground truth. I can measure how accurately I can detect the next peaks. And I get my distribution. And if I am systematically too early or too late, I can adjust uh, the value of T. For example, if I'm five milliseconds early, uh, on average, I can add uh, a five millisecond to my value of T and adjust that value. That way I hit the target five millisecond later than I originally uh, were intending. And that way I resolve the bias that I have, the systematic sh shift. But after I detect that, uh, find that adjusted value of T, the real time portion is exactly the same. I just detect the last peak and I project the next peak with the value of adjusted T. And this is the video for that. Uh, again, blue signal is ground truth. The orange signal is band pass filtered data in real time from half a second of uh, data in my window. I get rid of the edge at the end, and I this is the location of the last peak with the yellow square, and this is the black square is the projected peak, and the distance between these two is my adjusted T, so it's a constant distance. So when I play this, as you can see, uh, like I can track my peak pretty uh, like accurately, although the method is simple, but it's working well. 
and but because we have to objectively compare different methods uh, in our study that like that was published in 2020 uh, we validated these methods and in our validation we had like uh, two parts like the simulation which was based on pre-recorded resting EEG and it was based on 13 participants but we also implemented the setup in real time in our lab and did the experiments in real time the actual closed loop experiments on eight participants and this is the setup that we have in our lab uh, this is the TMS machine connected to a TMS coil. Uh, the participant sits here, it's me. Uh, I'm wearing the EEG cap, there are electrodes. You can measure the brain activity and send it to the EEG amplifier and send that data, stream that data to the computer where the processing happens and then send a trigger. There is a cable you can't see. There is a cable coming to the TMS machine where you can trigger the TMS. Uh, pulses and this is a camera for tracking the participant and the coil uh, just for proper coil placement it doesn't have anything to do with the closed loop aspect and in our experimental design uh, we did we compared the three algorithms that i mentioned fft ar and etp is our method uh, and we did that in three different brain regions, occipital cortex, motor cortex, and prefrontal cortex. And the way to localize the oscillation, we use the Laplacian montage. Uh, basically, we take the central electrode and we uh, like deduct the mean of the surrounding electrodes. That way you can kind of isolate the EEG signals from that region of interest, like in each of these regions. And uh, we did the experiments in alpha band, also in beta band, uh, as a proof of concept. Um, and we measured the accuracy of these algorithms. But before showing you the results, I'm going to talk to you about polar histograms in case you're not familiar with it. So with the regular histogram, you know that you have something like this, uh, that each like bar shows you how many values you have in that particular bin. But the tricky thing is that phase, uh, unlike the regular, like most typical values, is a circular value. So the uh, like it goes from zero to three hundred and sixty degrees, and then it goes back to the same place that it were so it's a circular method so on unlike regular histograms where you can go from negative infinity to plus infinity uh, the beginning and end of your values in phase are the same so if you just warp your histogram and put it on a circle you will get a polar histogram and similar to regular histogram, the values on the circle shows the phase uh, that goes from 0 to 360. And the length of the bar shows you how many values, how many phases you have in that particular phase bin. For example, between 0 and, I don't know, 10 degrees, you have like more than 400 uh, like phases in, in that phase bin. And throughout this uh, when i show you the results i show you the polar histograms for different methods and um, but and uh, also to quantify the polar histogram is a visual thing but if you want to quantify the accuracy in terms of number we also came up with this equation it's nothing fancy it's basically the absolute value of the deviation between the uh, phase that you targeted and the phase that you uh, want to target. For example, if you want to target the peak, it's like the phase of zero, and these these are the phases that you targeted at each trial, and you find the difference between them, and you know, we don't care about plus or minus, so we take the absolute value, you average them, and that gives you your uh, like average error kind of and because we care about accuracy we, we do one minus that error that gives you the accuracy so 
just to give you an idea of the values in terms of accuracy, the things that we get, if you hit everything correctly at all trials, uh, this is the polar histogram that you would get, and that will yield an accuracy of 1. And if you hit everything the opposite phase of what you intend to, imagine 0 is the phase that you care about. I care about the deviation between the targeted phase and the desired phase. If you hit everything the opposite of phase that you want, you get an accuracy of 0 and a polar histogram on this direction. And if you do an open loop uh, simulation, basically there is no uh, preference for any phase and you will get a uniform distribution uh, around all phases. And it's kind of close to a circle and you will get an accuracy of 0.5. With that in mind, uh, let's look at the simulation results for FFT, AR, and ETP algorithm. Uh, as you see, the FFT algorithm is fairly close to a uniform circle, so it's not doing much better than a, a like open loop simulation. But AR is uh, like more extended toward the right, so it is more uh, accurately uh, able to detect the phases. And ETP, which is our method, is even more like slightly more accurate than that, than the AR method. And then uh, if we quantify the accuracies uh, across different brain regions, we see that again, FFT have the, ha has the lowest accuracies compared to the other two methods and ETP is more accurate than the other uh, two methods. And what is interesting is that in all of the algorithms, occipital cortex has the highest accuracy, then followed by uh, motor cortex, then prefrontal cortex. And uh, we were curious about this, and I'm going to come back to this, why this is happening. Uh, that was the simulation results. This is the actual experiment result, and we were able to replicate a similar pattern. ETP is more accurate than AR, and they're both more accurate than FFT. And I uh, forgot to show the results for beta band uh, because it wasn't supplementary. Uh, these results were in the alpha band, but in the beta band, we show that ETP still is able to uh, detect the phases uh, in real time, but AR and FFT basically failed completely to detect uh, the phase in beta band. And the reason is that beta band is a much less stable band compared to alpha. Like the uh, quality of the signal is lower, the frequency band is wider, so it's generally... and it's a much faster rhythm, so it's generally harder to uh, detect those phases in the beta band. And just to show you, I talked to you about the importance of computation speed. Uh, and like in our experiments, I think uh, we used one kilohertz of sampling rate, which means like each sample comes uh, every one millisecond. So your processing should uh, be done in less than one millisecond. Otherwise, you will not be able to do that in real time. And to show you, uh, like, uh, to give you a general idea, the AR and FFT algorithms take around 0.8 millisecond, which is relatively close to that one millisecond uh, limit that we have. But ETP is much, much faster, like, almost 10, more than 10 times faster than the other two methods. And this means that you don't need a fancy computer or any dedicated hardware to be able to run this. Like if you have a slow computer, this will go above one millisecond and you wouldn't be able to run this in real time. And uh, just something to keep in mind. And the uh, last thing in our publication that I want to show you is we looked at the effect of signal to noise ratio. As you intuitively expect, the higher quality data you have, the higher accuracy in terms of phase detection you can get. And we show that indeed, when you get higher signal to noise ratio, the accuracy also goes higher for all three algorithms. And the reason 
that we see occipital cortex has the highest accuracy in all brain regions is that uh, as you might know the alpha band in the occipital cortex has the strongest alpha in the brain and basically this SNR in the occipital cortex is high and therefore you, you get higher accuracy and I talked about the details of the some methods but those are not the only methods out there uh, they there were they were the main methods when we published our paper but there are some other methods out there some more recent ones as well that uh, this is not an exhaustive list but just to give you an idea uh, sorry uh, like in this paper they use a uh, uh, forward prediction in frequency domain, but instead of FFT, they use wavelet, but the general idea is similar to FFT. This paper uses, uh, again, an autoregressive model. It's slightly different from the one I, I described, but the idea is still the same. Uh, in this paper, they try to detect peaks and trough but they did not do any like kind of forward prediction they are uh, they just had a thresholding thing so if the data was higher than a certain threshold they quant like quantified that as a peak and if it was below a certain threshold they called that a trough so it's uh, like much more simpler method and probably lower accuracy and this recent paper, they used machine learning uh, to predict phase, uh, but, and this is basically categorized as the learning-based um, category of methods because you learn from the signal, then you use it to predict the phase. And uh, in my talk, I focused on EEG phase, but there are other metrics that you might be interested in using. For example, amplitude of the signal, power of the signal, connectivity between brain regions. And you can use those different metrics uh, as a readout from the state of your brain and deliver your TMS based on the state that you care about. And shortly, I'm going to go over the current work that we're doing on closed loop. So um, our postdoc, Miles Wisniewski, is uh, uh, basically f has, has finished the experiments and he's writing up the paper, should be submitted uh, pretty soon. Uh, we applied the closed loop system that we had in alpha band and in beta band in four different phases, like peak, falling phase, trough, and rising phase. And we recorded the uh, MEPs from like uh, uh, EMG signals. Basically, we put the TMS coil on the motor cortex and we induced some finger twitches. We measured uh, those MEPs and we showed that indeed there is a phase relationship. And that phase relationship not only depends on the actual phase that you stimulate the TMS, but also on the band that you are targeting like mu band and beta band show different uh like outcomes in terms of MEPs. this is exciting and we hope to like publish it soon but also uh, we're working on new algorithm and uh, although our algorithm works well the one that i uh, showed you but we still want to improve that uh, to be able to work with a wide range of frequencies like theta, alpha, beta, gamma. The previous one worked well with alpha and beta, but not so well with theta and gamma, but we're trying to improve on that and target all of these frequency bands and also improve the accuracy to get as like better if we can. And we're almost there. We should also be able to publish, like submit this soon. And as a conclusion, uh, we talked about how to use EEG phase as a biomarker to do closed loop brain stimulation. Uh, we went over the challenges that we have in real time phase detection, and I talked about the details of three methods in three different categories of methods for online phase detection. And I showed you that sometimes using simpler method, you can get better results. 
and the accuracy of your phase detection depends on the quality of your signal as expected and uh, we like shared all of the codes uh, for the real-time applications in our github account in case you are interested you can go to github.com slash opitz lab uh, we have we're sharing some uh, things from our lab but uh, also are like close to codes and there is always room for improvement so we're trying to improve our uh, algorithms to get better outcomes but generally speaking there is a new avenue for this closed loop application it has opened up recently and there is a lot of interest in doing that and there are some exciting things coming out of it and with that i want to thank uh, everyone in my lab who helped me with this project and also uh, the funding agencies for providing the money to help us to do this research and i want to thank you all for your attention uh, you can ask any questions or email me excellent thank you very much Sina. that was very interesting thank you for your time and uh, to explain uh, how you arrived at, at, at those algorithms and, and how they compare and um i'm putting it in a way that was was easy to follow as well certainly i, I think from my side but but i'm uh, hopefully the same for, for the attendees as well and um, if you do have any questions then as i mentioned please feel free to pop them into the q a um box uh on the the meeting platform um there's a there's a question from that, that came in a little bit earlier on uh, um, just before you started talking about some of the other frequencies, in fact, so um, uh, Craig, I might adapt the question on your behalf, given that uh, it came in, um, it changed a little bit. Feel free to pop your hand up in the chat as well if uh, if you'd like to expand on it further. But it was asking about why alpha bands uh, in particular, why not other frequencies? So you did mention then that you you know you have in the publication itself looked at beta and then now looking at others any particular reason why then alpha was was the first one um again i think you touched on it a little bit now but is, is there anything else you'd like to add there yes um uh, big for the sake of time i did not talk about all the science background because my focus was on the methods uh, but uh, in the introduction i mentioned that there were several studies that uh, offline, uh, during offline analysis, they showed that the excitability of the brain depends on the phase of the EEG. They were mainly focused on the alpha band. So those analysis have shown uh, that relationship mainly for the alpha band. We don't have much more information about the other bands. And that's why uh, our group and other group who started this closed loop, they focused on alpha band first. But now, uh, because uh, it's challenging to track other frequency bands in real time, uh, we tried to improve our algorithm. And for the first time, we were able to run the beta band in real time, and I showed you the results. So... Um, this one. So previous methods were not able to track beta band in the first place, so they could not show such a relationship before that. And we are also working on other frequency bands, but as I explained, uh, it's not easy to do that, and we're trying to improve the technical uh, aspects of uh, like the closed loop system to be able to track those uh, other bands. But by all means, other bands are also important. But also the reason um, previous groups focused on alpha band is because they were focusing on the motor cortex. And we know uh, motor cortex has a like strong new rhythm, which is in the alpha range. Uh, and that's one of the main reasons that they have focused in this region, because you don't have uh as strong uh, oscillation in the other bands if that makes sense but i think so um uh hopefully craig that that does help to to answer your question as i said feel free to add another one if, if uh, you want to take that further and um, so next we have uh, maybe a couple of questions from robert uh, who i think uh, we've been able to connect the audio to so robert uh, if you if you can speak go ahead and, and you can ask your questions directly 
Okay, I'll try to speak and hope everyone knows me. Yeah, <laughs> yes. I can hear you. That's great. Oh, thanks for the talk, um, um, Shirinpur, Mr. Shirinpur. Um, you mentioned that you achieve uh, a standard events of around 70 degrees. Um, others report more or less uh, regarding the algorithms. I was wondering what um, accuracy of standard deviation do you think will be necessary to achieve good plasticity effects if we do some TMS um, intervention? Uh, yes, so one clarification, uh, the accuracy metric we used is not standard deviation, but it's kind of similar. Uh, anyway, like that is a great question. We don't know the answer to that because it's a fairly new field. Like it's like three, four years at most that we have started to do this thing in TMS. And obviously the higher accuracy, the better. But if I have to guess at the very least, you should be able to target uh, like most of your phases, like within the quadrant, like maybe like most of your phases should be within uh, 45 degree or 60 degrees of the targeted phase is the minimum accuracy that I think you would need. But I could be wrong. It's not tested before. But it's a good question. Thanks. I would have a second question. Um, you mentioned that the accuracy is linked to the tuning noise ratio. Um, do you have any findings or, or simulation results on how this is linked to the systematic latency? I would assume that if you have dedicated hardware that, let's say, triggers within a millisecond, um, the accuracy would be improved drastically, right? Do you have any? Um, yes, that that is correct. Uh, I don't have the results here, but basically, as I explained, uh, one one of the reasons we use forward prediction is to deal with the hardware delays that you have. And for example, if you have your hardware delay is 10 millisecond, you have to predict 10 millisecond in the future. But if your hardware delay is one millisecond, you only need to predict one millisecond in the future. So the shorter you have to predict, the higher the accuracy becomes. That is, um, that is obvious. I don't have the results right now, but I have to don run some simulations so I know it happens, but uh, off the top of my head, I don't have the actual numbers to tell you. But uh, even if you have like uh, super fast hardwares that does not have any delays, you still have to deal with the edge artifact that uh, we talked about. And so you still have uh, some uh, forward prediction that you have to do to take care of the edge that you remove. So generally speaking, there is a cap in terms of accuracies that you can uh, have. And obviously, uh, there, there might be some methods that work better than the others. But uh, regardless of the methods, uh, we found that the higher SNR means higher accuracy. OK, thanks. You're welcome. Um, and I think we have time for just one last question. Um, which hopefully I think the virtual microphone has just been just made its way over to uh, Claudia. Uh, if you can, Claudia, you can go ahead and, and ask your question. Yeah. Hi. Thanks. Um, thanks for the presentation. I was wondering if you also try to use the alpha peak for each individual instead of doing this uh, distance between consecutive peaks to find your best period. Uh, can you repeat your question? Isn't that what I'm already doing? So as as I understood it, you're filtering your resting state, e.g., and then you look at the distance between consecutive peaks. Yes. Did you obtain the same result Is if you just run a power spectral density and find the main frequency? Uh, for this part, yes, you would get the same result because uh, this first part just gives you an like a, an initial uh, response, like an in initial value for your type, uh, like cycle. And then in the second step, if you're 
too late or too early, it is adjusted anyway. Okay. So it doesn't matter how you choose your initial value, but obviously the better your initial estimate, the faster the uh, adjustment will be. But it doesn't matter how you draw your first estimate. You can use the frequency content if you want. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. And I, I know I said that was the last one, but uh, one sort of question just snuck in right at the last minute, um, which I, I will ask on your behalf, Mo. Um, so wh why didn't you remove the edge in the FFT method? We tried uh, adding edge to the FFT method. We did not find any uh, reasonable improvement in, in terms of results. And obviously, the, you can try different things. You can try to improve FFT as well, but generally speaking, I don't think it's the best method because it's hard to capture a good estimate of the frequency content of the signal if you have a very short window of data. Okay, 